This is incredible. You like it? Oh my oh, god. That is such a relief because I worked so hard on it. No. You know, I call it Max Famous Mac and Cheese. No. <laughs> I like to recommend to our first timers our signature cocktail, Caribbean Paradise. Some people say it's better than busting the Excuse me? Hey, I got a piping hot grilled frank for you, okay? I got the sausage, the spam, the bacon. I got it wrapped in a jelly pancake and cooked with a stick of butter. I don't want that, Charlie. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week I forgot to record that sort of walk-on thing that I do, which is why we're looking at this creepy still photo of me that will come to life right now. First up, we're tackling Max Famous Mac and Cheese, which was revealed to be nothing more than factory standard blue box. It's been a while since I made one of these, but I think I can... Huh, 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 huh. Huh. So let's see what it tastes like, and I gotta say, it tastes exactly like Kraft Mac and Cheese. Nothing wrong with that, but as per usual, I think we can do better, especially when it comes to stovetop mac and cheese. Thanks to a method from America's Test Kitchen in a medium saucepan, I am combining one cup of milk and one and a half cups of water. Bring that to a simmer while I toast some panko breadcrumbs and melted butter. And then once simmering, adding eight ounces of the pasta of your choice, I'm going with radiatore, and over medium low heat, gently cooking the pasta until all the liquid is absorbed. So as you can see, I'm just going back and forth between cooking my pasta, flipping my breadcrumbs, cooking my pasta, flipping my breadcrumbs, until the breadcrumbs are nice toasty golden brown, at which point we're going to remove them from the heat, put them in a bowl, and toss them with about two ounces of grated Romano cheese, which smells nothing short of totally awesome. Meanwhile, back on the stovetop, our pasta is done cooking, so over very low heat, we're going to add four ounces of shredded American cheese, along with a heaping half teaspoon of Dijon mustard. I know you're probably rolling your eyes at the cheese choice, but this is just for sauce cohesion. Once the American is melted, we're adding an additional four ounces of sharp cheddar and a little shake of cayenne, and then we're killing the heat, covering and letting sit for five minutes. After which point you will be greeted by the cheesiest, stretchiest, creamiest mac and cheese you have ever had the good fortune to be in the same room as, which we are then going to kick up to 11 by topping with our Romano panko breadcrumbs. So let's see, is this ultra easy stovetop mac and cheese better than the stuff out of the box? I mean, what did you think? It's, it's awesome. And it probably only takes like five more minutes to make than the radioactive orange stuff. As you can imagine, it was a pretty big hit here at the office, with Sawyer and Vinny sequestering the bowl in a valiant effort to save my waistline. Next up, let's make us some Caribbean paradise. I'm gonna start off with what is officially recognized by the International Bartenders Association as the Paradise Cocktail, which is kind of like a flapper precursor to gin and juice. As such, it starts off with three ounces of gin, one and a half ounces of apricot brandy, and one and a half ounces of orange juice, so a two to one to one ratio shaken over ice. It is then strained into a chilled martini glass, then given an optional splash of lemon juice and an optional lemon twist. Now Sawyer is celebrating his one year anniversary of joining me here at Binge Entertainment, so how about we all raise a glass, including him, in the middle of the day, on a Thursday. We will discuss this in private when you get into the office tomorrow, okay? I'm just kidding, of course. Thanks for sticking with me, buddy, despite my stupid jokes. Next up, let's try this layered cocktail that is more widely known as the Caribbean Paradise. We're starting with a slightly more festive glass with half an ounce of grenadine in the bottom, topping that up with ice to the brim, and then in a cocktail shaker combining three ounces of fresh pineapple juice and one and a half ounces of coconut flavored rum. Shake those guys together over ice, strain into the cocktail glass, and then we need to discuss the science of layering. As you can see, if you just gently pour in blue curacao, it just mixes into the rest of the drink and looks ugly, gross, and awful. But if we make a combination of one ounce of blue curacao and one ounce of water, that mixture is going to have a lower density than the pineapple rum mixture, so it will float on top and create the desired layered effect, even if we do spill it all over the counter. Now I gotta say, I do not understand some layered cocktails, especially one like this with grenadine at the bottom because it's just too sweet. Personally, I will stick with the 1930s gin and juice. Last up, the big one, grilled frank. We got about four and a half ounces of all-purpose flour, to which we're going to add a teaspoon and a half of baking powder, a pinch of salt, and a tablespoon of white sugar. Tiny whisk that together, and then it's time to make a facsimile of buttermilk by adding either one tablespoon of lemon juice or white vinegar to one cup of whole milk and letting it chill out for 10 minutes. 10 minutes later, and wow, nothing has changed. But our milk will now carry the sort of tang that buttermilk would normally bring to the party. Into our quote-unquote buttermilk, we're going to crack one egg and pour in three tablespoons of melted butter. Tiny whisk those together until homogenous, and then it's time to bring together our dry and wet ingredients. You might notice that this pancake batter doesn't have as many leaveners in it as usual, and it's pretty thin. And that's because we're trying to make a thin pancake, which will be easier to wrap all of the goodies in. Speaking of goodies, it's time to cook all the various meats in a grilled frank, a few strips of thick-cut bacon, a few breakfast sausages, and of course because the writers were probably trying to make it sound extra gross, a nice heaping helping of spam. 
spam. I'm just gonna cut off some nice thin slices and stack them up next to our other meats and bake this whole affair at about 400 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 to 25 minutes or until everybody is nice and brown and crisp. And so now it's pancake time. Into a large nonstick skillet goes a tablespoon of butter that we're gonna melt and let get soaked up by our first sacrificial pancake, which we're gonna use as an indicator for our future pancakes thickness and fluffiness, and I want it a little thinner actually, so I'm gonna thin out the batter with a little extra milk, maybe about a third of a cup's worth, regular size whisked together and ladled into a hot skillet. And as you can see, the batter is so thin, it's almost approaching a crepe batter, which of course gives me ideas for later on, but for now we're just cooking this like a regular old pancake, which I decided to flip without a spatula for your comedic enjoyment. Uh, Huh, I actually nailed it. Anyway, over medium high heat, this guy's cooking for about two to three minutes per side. And of course we're gonna make a backup pancake. Always make a backup pancake. You do not wanna get caught with your pants down with no backup pancake. There is no excuse, be safe, be smart, back up your pancakes. Anyway, I'm throwing down our various meats like so many decks of cards, flanking with our many, many breakfast sausages. And then it's time to wrap this guy up and try to fry the whole thing in a stick of butter, which I'm not entirely sure how that's possible. But as always, we are gonna do our damn Get that stick of butter nice and melted, and once it's melted, go ahead and drop in the grilled frank, which we're gonna fruitlessly try to fry. It's not really possible to flip this thing without all of its contents gleefully spilling out, so a good compromise seems to be to butter baste it like a fine steak. And the butter is starting to brown, which is just gonna imbue this thing with a bunch of toasty brown butter flavor. Can't believe I'm actually getting kind of excited to try this thing. Now, I know what you're thinking, where's the jelly? Well, I'll tell you, I forgot to put it in there, so we're just gonna dump it on top. I really don't think it's gonna make that much of a difference, and it looks kinda nice. Not really. Let's get a cross section going here, not the most impressive one in the world, but we haven't had one on the show in a while. Try to assemble a bite with a little bit of everything and shove it in your face. And I gotta say, it's not disgusting. I mean, it's not good. Like, I wouldn't order it in a restaurant, but it's inoffensive and yada yada yada, I think we can do better. Let's start with the jelly and we're gonna go savory by making some jalapeno jelly. So we're gonna start by roughly chopping a green pepper, a red pepper, and a few jalapenos. Not removing the seeds because we want a little bit of that heat. And we're processing to a salsa-like consistency in a food processor. Then in a medium bowl, go two cups of granulated sugar and three teaspoons of pectin powder, which we're gonna tiny whisk together until homogenous. And then we're gonna set that aside and in a medium saucepan combine our chopped up peppers and one cup of white vinegar. Cover, bring to a simmer and cook for 10 minutes. In the meantime, I'm also gonna heat up a giant pot of water. This is for heating up our canning jars and eventually canning our jelly. And then once the peppers have simmered for 10 minutes, we're adding the sugar pectin mixture and cooking for an additional two minutes until everybody is nice and dissolved. Remove from the heat and allow to cool for a little while, like 15 minutes. And then out of the hot but not boiling water come our canning jars, which we are going to fill, leaving a one quarter inch headspace at the top of the jar. Go ahead and give those a wipe down because you made a big, terrible mess. Top up with the lid things and then finger tighten the screwy things. And then these guys are gently lowered into a pot with enough boiling water to cover them completely, where they shall boil for 10 minutes, creating a safely preserved preserve, which we're going to remove from the boiling water and see if the caps have popped down yet, indicating that a vacuum has been created created and the contents will be kept sealed. They often don't pop down right away, so just give them a few minutes before they- <gasps> Oh my god, did you see that? Enhance image. Holy f***ing shit. So now just let these guys cool overnight and they will keep for one year. But we're gonna need them much sooner than that. First, let's make some crepe batter. Into the jar of a blender goes two eggs, three quarters of a cup of whole milk, half a cup of water, one cup of all-purpose flour, and three tablespoons of melted butter in a very easy recipe courtesy of Alton Brown. Go ahead and pulse that together about 10 times, making sure that it's nice and smooth and homogenous. And then we're gonna let it chill out in the fridge for at least 45 minutes up to overnight to let the bubbles get out of there. Break out the old crepe maker for the first time since the SNL taco. Lubricate with unsalted butter and begin the delicate, practiced art of making crepes, which is of course definitely gonna take a few tries to get right. Even if, like me, you spent the summer of your 16th year making crepes at a place called Simply Crepes. Just keep at it and before you know it, you will be pouring, spreading, and flipping with the proficiency, poise, and panache of a Parisian. But we have something decidedly un-Parisian in mind for these crepes. Since Charlie proceeded to fry the whole affair in a stick of butter, we're gonna fill every crepe with a couple pieces of each of our meats and then wrap the whole thing up using a burrito rolling technique, which we're going to then bread and deep fry to make pantras, an Indian snack that I am positive that I did not pronounce correctly. We've got a standard basic breading station here of one egg beaten together with about a half a cup of milk, which we are going to thoroughly coat the crepe in before evenly and generously coating with plain breadcrumbs. 
And now onto the frying. As you probably know, you cannot deep fry in butter, it will burn. So in keeping with the Indian inspiration behind this dish, I have ghee, which is just clarified butter, which I'm going to heat to 375 degrees Fahrenheit before dropping these guys in to effectively deep fry. And check that out, it's like France, India, and Mexico all got together to make a Grand Slam breakfast. And then there's the matter of plating. I'm not crazy about the ever-trendy chef smear when it comes to this jalapeno jelly. So let's take a break and cut this on the diagonal to take a look at the cross section. And then that gave me an idea. How about a nice dollop of jelly topped with this pretty little pedestal of meaty pancake, which as you can imagine is a massive improvement on the original. Is it deeply unhealthy and culturally confused? Yes. Is it a member of the Clean Plate Club? Also yes. Hey guys, so I am super excited to announce that I made an appearance on Jon Favreau's new Netflix series, The Chef Show. This feel-good foodie fantasy is jam-packed with beautiful recipes, heart, humor, and celebrity guests like Robert Downey Jr. and Gwyneth Paltrow and me for some reason. Thank you so much, John, for having me on the show. You can watch me, him, and Roy Choi make Carl Casper's infamous molten lava cake on episode 3, but you gotta watch the whole series. It is on Netflix now. Go check it out.